This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is why I go to the gym. This is the Alienware Area 51M R2, so the second generation of their desktop replacement class gaming laptop with Intel desktop CPUs inside and socketed upgradable nominally graphics cards as well. Well, it's actually my favorite Alienware. We're going to look at it now. So what's the perfect use for such a powerful laptop? Data science and analytics. Speaking of that, thanks to our sponsor for this video, DataCamp. So analytics right now is indispensable for a variety of businesses and data scientists are in demand, i.e. it pays pretty well too. You can pay for that nifty new laptop. Learn data science and analytics using their bite-sized courses that can fit into any schedule both available for your desktop and for your mobile device is completely web-based. So you don't have to install any software or anything like that. Ah, but it's interactive too. They have more than 330 courses and almost 300 instructors too. You've got both videos to watch for instruction and interactive time with your instructors as well. It starts at $25 a month and that includes unlimited lessons and unlimited assessments as well. These are self-paced interactive courses. So yes, indeed, it's interactive, but still you can do it at your own pace. Again, if you already have a job, you're going to school for something else and you want to learn a second skill, it all works out. Be sure to sign up using our link in the description. Go for it. Now back to our video. But wait, there's more to your carry, to your love. So this laptop is so powerful, it requires two power supplies. This is a 330 watt power supply and this one is 180 watt. I believe if you go with a Core i9 overclockable and the RTX 2080 Super, this might actually be a 240 watt, so slightly bigger again. You can use it with just one charger. If you're doing light work or streaming video, it might tell you, hey, put in both for optimal performance. So you could just use the 330 watt. That's why they're unbalanced in size. So this is enough to power it if you have to. All right, so why is this my favorite Alienware gaming laptop? Well, because these days there are not many desktop replacements, period, on the market. And for those of you who don't need to carry it around in your backpack everywhere, you just want to take it from room to room in the house and you want a quiet, powerful PC, well, desktop replacements still fit that bill. And beyond that, this one has, like I said, the Intel desktop CPU. You can get a Core i7, a Core i7K overclockable, a Core i9, or a Core i9 K series overclockable 10th gen CPU inside. And the graphics card, as we know, besides the fact that this is a socketed desktop CPU, so you can pop it out and pop another one in. The uh, graphics cards use the Dell connector, the DGFF. So supposedly they're pushing desktop level performance on the GPU, but physically it is still smaller than the desktop card. But anyway, pulling a lot of watts here. So that is swappable and upgradable. For those of you who watched our Alienware Area 51 original version video, which I'll link to in the description, you remember the big promise here was, wow, an upgradable laptop. We haven't seen this in decades almost, it seems like so. The CPU is, and this uses the Intel Z490 chipset, which the next 11th gen CPU Rocket Lake should use. So in theory, it would be compatible. Whether the BIOS supports it, I don't know. So the idea, my me, we're still stuck with 10th gen here, but you could upgrade if you started with the Core i7 base model and you want to go to Core i9 OC or something like that. And with the graphics cards, it's just going to be within the RTX 20 family of GPUs. There's no promised upgrade to go into RTX 30 GPUs. Uh, you could use a Alienware graphics amplifier or a Thunderbolt 3 external one if you wanted to go to a 3000 series and keep using this laptop. So take the upgradability with a grain of salt. What it does give you, another thing I like that was repairability. It used to be if your CPU died or your GPU, and that happened with some of the first Area 51 first gens because they're letting you overclock that GPU and overvolt it pretty high, I, you just get another one, swap it in. Likewise, RAM is still socketed here. Unlike the regular Alienware M17 R3 and M15 R3 that now have soldered RAM because they're trying to make them so thin, this has two RAM slots. Yes, that is down from four RAM slots in the original model of the Area 51, but I, I'm guessing they did this for speed reasons and that gets pretty complicated and geeky. But anyway, you can go up to 64 gigs of RAM. There's two options now. The RAM is now faster too. 2933 megahertz and you can go up to 64 gigs or they have 3200 megahertz XMP RAM support. In fact, we have 16 gigs of that, dual channel configurations. That goes up to 32 gigs max right now. So for those who are hoping for that faster RAM in the last generation, well, it's finally here now. 
Cooling before was pretty good on the Area 51, but there was room for improvement, especially for those who were trying to take advantage of overclocking for the overclockable CPUs. So now the CPU has a vapor chamber, which is something they're also doing with the regular M15, M17 line. So that is more effective. In fact, temperatures are better, and the Intel 10th generation CPUs are a bit be better behaved, thermally speaking, even though the architecture isn't a lot different. What I can tell you is we have the core i7 10700K, so it's the i7 overclockable 8 core CPU. It performs a lot like the last generation i9 overclockable, but without the thermal problems that we saw in the original one on the i9 CPU. And now we still have the lunar light and dark side of the moon colors, but just like the M15, M17, again, we had the high performance clear coat. So, you know, Cheeto fingers, all that sort of thing. It, it was possible to get stained yellow palm rests, I hear, with the lunar light eventually. That should go away, not be a problem. The keyboard has also changed on this. The old one had the bevel side keys, which really felt good. I know a lot of people said, oh my God, that looks like such an old style keyboard, but really was very pleasant to type on. So now they've gone to the chiclet or island style keyboard, which to me, I thought I wasn't going to be too happy, but it feels very good. It's got a nice crisp feel, good key return, all that sort of thing. A lot like what you would see on the M17 R3. And your M17 R3 had an improved keyboard over the R2. So give it a try before you say no to the newer style keyboard. So the keyboard is per key RGB backlit with the usual Alienware FX effects to light it up. The Alienware logo on the lid lights up, unless you don't want it to, then you can turn it off, as well as the Tron light on the back, which is the light ring on the back, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, they're still not doing it. MSI does, which is lighting up the USB-A ports, which is really handy. And also the trackpad still lights up. That's something that I miss on the M series of Alienware thin and light gaming laptops where that doesn't light up. This is a Synaptics trackpad with two dedicated soft touch clickers on it. My guess is they're using Synaptics instead of Microsoft Precision, probably because this special light up trackpad may be not available with Precision setup. Anyway, it works just fine. It looks slightly small relative to the big chassis here, but I like it. It works. It's predictable. Behaves well. Keyboard, like I said, I like the feel of it. Yes, it's not the bevel keys, but then again, it's a pretty durable keyboard and uh, it's comfortable. It's got good key travel. It's even suitable for gaming. So desktop replacement laptop with a desktop CPU inside can't be cheap, right? And no, it's not cheap, obviously, but Alienware's in general are not, unless they're having a great sale. But it starts at around, well, under $2,500. The lowest end configurations have the Core i7-10700, not K model, just the regular i7, not overclockable. And they have the GTX 1660 Ti card, which I think is going to be kind of low. And if you're buying this kind of laptop, you probably wouldn't do it, unless you're figuring, well, I'll just pick up one of the other GPU cards from Dell later and upgrade it. Anyway or under $2,500 for that one. If you want to get an RTX 2060, it starts to get more interesting. Then you're looking at around, well, $2,550 or so. And you can go to town, and you can go up to the Core i9 10900K, which is an overclockable 10-core i9 CPU, which for thermal reasons and gaming reasons, I wouldn't. I'll talk about that so much. But anyway, and you can go up to the RTX 2080 Super, and you could blow out $4,000 if you really want to go to town on this one. To me, the sweet spot would be the Core i7-10700K that we have here and the RTX 2070 Super, because you get a lot of performance with the 2070 Super with a bit less thermal consideration than you do with the 2080 and hundreds of dollars less than the 2080 cost. Uh, the performance delta to me isn't as much worth it. I know some of you are hardcore enthusiasts or benchers and you just want to get the highest benchmark number as possible. That's your decision there. Why would I pick the i7 over the i9? Mostly for thermal reasons. And if you're gaming, the difference between 8 and 10 cores really isn't there so much. But for those of you who are buying this to use ZBrush and do rendering and professional work, that sort of thing, work mobile workstation level only on steroids, which is really what this is, then I could see doing the i9 or the i9 overclockable. Why would I pick the overclockable i7 over the base one, not because I want to overclock it, but actually for other thermal consideration reasons here. You unlock all the control over timings, the CPU voltage, all that stuff, you know, not just undervolting using throttle stop. And you can use Alienware Command Center to do this stuff, or you could do it yourself, but you can't use the BIOS to change the timings, by the way. They have that locked down. But anyway, the K gives you the versatility to actually control your thermals better, because this thing has so much power. I mean, I'm playing borderlands at 130 frames per second on ultra at 1080p that 
really what I want to do is control the thermal zones. I don't want to hear a lot of noise. I don't want to be forced to wear a headset just to drown out my laptop. I don't want to have to worry about the, the CPU longevity, much as Dell engineers say, oh, it's okay to hit 100, and as we all know. And a lot of Intel engineers say, really, it's better to keep your CPU at 80, especially a desktop CPU, or less. So it's pretty easy to do here and have phenomenal frame rates for 1080p gaming. Now, there is enough horsepower here for gaming that you could certainly easily game at 2K and even 4K resolutions. But I think 2K is the, frame, the sweet spot if you really like high frame rates. 4K, you're looking at frame rates in the 60s for most games. Not PS4 ports like Control, which are typically pigs, but for more optimized games. So there you have it. Desktop replacement can equal quiet, peaceful, I'm not going to burn up my laptop style gaming. That's what I like about it. Now, in terms of the displays, those have a, we got a whole new set of options from the Area 51 Original Edition, which I thought was a little lacking. For example, there was no 4K option on that one for people who are content creators and are buying this to do rendering or video editing. So we do have a 4K 60 Hz wide gamut display option, and that one is matte. We also have the base, which is 144 Hz full HD IPS, and the one that we have, which is a 300 Hz IPS display. These are the same display options that are available, no surprise, on the Alienware M17R3. They're using the same panels on both. And because NVIDIA just announced their RTX 3000 series cards today and faster G-Sync and all that sort of thing, uh, there's going to be a 360 hertz option, which gets to be mind-boggling, but hey. I do like the 300 hertz display, just because everything seems so buttery smooth and there's no ghosting and it's fast response times, and the color gamut's a little better than that 144 hertz base model. Dell does have options with and without G-Sync. I really wouldn't worry about G-Sync if you're getting something like the 300 hertz display, though, because <laughs> the display is going to be faster, most likely, than any frame rate you're going to be getting out of most games. Although, it's possible with something like Overwatch, if you're playing on high settings even, that you might. But anyway. Uh, interestingly enough, on our machine, it show, the Intel integrated HD 630 graphics shows up, but you can't use it. You can't switch to it. Usually when it's dedicated graphics only, you don't even see it in Device Manager. So it's interesting. This is the kind of laptop you're going to use on dedicated graphics all the time. It has a 90 watt hour battery. So given the performance requirements of this machine, it's there not just so you can move it from room to room while it's unplugged without shutting down like a desktop computer would. You can actually run it for about two hours if you're doing something like streaming video or surfing the web, and that sort of thing. So it has some independent from the outlet functionality going on. In terms of the power that it consumes, I mean, obviously we have 510 watts of power possible here from these power adapters. And if you are playing with overclocking and all that sort of thing, then you might actually need that much power. The way I have it tuned, which is not really very conservative, and you can see the profile that I set up in Alienware Command Center, I'm setting the the CPU voltage at 1.3 volt, which is perfectly reasonable. I, I, Overvolting a CPU is a great way to get it really hot. I have an undervolt also for negative 65 millivolts. And the core clocks I'm setting at a max of 4.8 gigahertz on all cores. So that's pretty reasonable stuff. And there I typically see when gaming hitting about 300 to 320 watts total power. The CPU is typically using 120. The GPU is using the rest of that. It's quite a lot of watts to be pulling through a laptop. But again, that's something that you're doing when you're plugged in. In terms of ports on this, well, it's a big old laptop. You're going to have plenty of ports, obviously. Plenty of USB-A ports. You have a Thunderbolt 3 port. And by the way, it works with Wacom displays without any hanky-panky weirdness, that USB-C Thunderbolt 3 port. And you've got DisplayPort, and you've got HDMI, and of course you've got a headphone jack, and yay, a full-size SD card slot. So the port situation, as you expect, is good. And you have an Alienware graphics amplifier port, too, which is still, if you're going to stick with the Alienware brand, um, a reasonably affordable way of adding an external GPU. It's typically a bit cheaper than a Thunderbolt 3 enclosure is, but you could do a Thunderbolt 3 enclosure on this as well. We have stereo speakers with the front vents for the audio, like we saw on the M15 and M17 most recent generations, and the audio is pretty good. I mean, it should be. This is a huge laptop. There's no subwoofer here, but it has a reasonable amount of bass on it. It's fairly pleasing. When I play games without putting a headset on, I don't feel like it's tinny. <laughs>
For competitors, we have the MSI GT76 Titan because they don't offer the range of configurations going to lower end GPUs and all that sort of thing. That has a desktop CPU in it besides, but it's pretty much a high end configuration. So you're looking at around $43 to $4,500. That one does not have a socketed GPU and it has typical MSI aesthetics, which is to say a little bit challenged, but hey, there's more to a laptop than the beauty of it, but it's a lot more expensive typically, unless you really configure the Alienware up and then there's price parity on. Uh, Asus is pretty much leaving the desktop replacement model behind for the moment. Of course, there's always some Clevo chassis that are available to you too. So there's not a super lot of direct competitors going on here. Gigabytes, Aorus, they're not using desktop CPUs. So, but other than that, big chassis laptops with lots of cooling, you get there. Take the bottom cover off. You just unscrew the Phillips head screws are all visible and then just pry your way around. It's a little easy if you start from the front. It's not too hard to get off or use a suction cup to speed things up. So you can see there's little tangs. It slides underneath the butt area here. So here's our internals. Looks almost identical to the last generation. And here, instead of seeing heat pipes, we can see the vapor chamber over the CPU, which is very cool. And if we look in from the side, you'll see the bayonet that lifts up the CPU anchor point because it's a desktop CPU, so that works just like, well, a desktop CPU. Our RAM is right over here. Again, we got the 3200 megahertz RAM with 16 gigs in dual channel mode. Yes, in the last generation, and the height is still here available for it. There were four slots for RAM. Now we're down to two. Methinks this is probably for speed optimizations and other things that get really geeky and, you know, tech folks love to argue over such things. That's my guess. Here is our socketed Wi-Fi card. It's the Killer 1650i Wi-Fi 6 card. Good card. Obviously, really nice, big, smooth fans going right here. Nice deep dish turbine style. Battery is here, 90 watt hour. And this is the boot SSD or SSD1 M.2 NVMe. Here's the slot for a second SSD if you wanted. And here's where it gets interesting. So over here, obviously, this is, you can tell, a caddy for a hard drive. You can put a three and a half, a two and a half inch SSD in here or a spinning mechanical drive. Alternatively, they also make a connector which would replace this, which connects to the motherboard over there. So you could have two more M.2 PCIe SSDs. And Dell does say they're PCIe if you do that. So that's uh, interesting and versatile. So there's the internals. If you want to take this fully apart, then you take off the aft cover over here where the Tron lights are. Four screws, shiny ones, you can't miss them. There's two on the rear edge. Slide this off and then under the screws that hold this shroud down. So underneath here we have separation of cooling just like the first generation, which is a good thing. No heat pollution between the GPU and the CPU. Sometimes one heats the other up. You know how that goes, right? So they're separated here underneath. Anyway, to unscrew these screws, take that off. You're going to have to take out the Wi-Fi card just because the the cable is routing over the, over the cover over here. Unscrew some of the battery screws. Not a bad idea to disconnect your battery when taking something further apart because that screws down into the frame. And then you can repaste your CPU or GPU if you wish to do so. If you want to see that in detail, go look at our Alienware Area 51M original version review. I'll link to that in the description so you can see me taking apart everything. So that's the Alienware Area 51 M2. It's a load, granted, but that's, like I said, why I go to the gym. It's really not that bad, folks. Hey, it's a lot of laptop for the money. That's something to say about this. When you compare this to a 16-inch MacBook Pro or some other $3,000 gaming laptops with regular mobile CPUs inside, you can understand the appeal of this. But again, this is not for people who are going to need to take this to class every day or commute with it constantly. Obviously, this is for those of you who move it from room to room, take it to your friends, to have a little LAN party. Do people still have LAN parties? I don't know. Anyway, you get the idea. A lot of power and that peace of mind of being able to cool the machine are kind of nice. And it's pretty future proof. Let's face it. Yes, eventually RTX 3000 GPUs are going to come to laptops too. Probably not until the spring of 2021. I'm thinking right now we're having a fall launch for the desktop parts and they use more watts. But anyway, the amount of horsepower in here in terms of computing and still in terms of graphics is enough to drive any game at ultra settings from anywhere from 120 frames all the way up to 250 frames. So this is not going to go obsolete anytime soon, which is kind of nice too.
I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and thumbs up if you like this vid.